Today, we have the opportunity to sit down with Dr. Jan Holden. Jan is one of the leading scientists in the field of near-death studies. She's the president of the International Association for Near-Death Studies and the editor of the scholarly, peer-reviewed academic journal, The Journal of Near-Death Studies. Few questions have been as hotly contested throughout history as to what happens when we die. All major religions have put forth an answer, but finally, science has weighed in on the subject. What we're about to discuss today is one of the most important scientific discoveries of the 20th century and has massive implications about the nature of life itself. For over 40 years, Dr. Holden has studied people who have died, but then under extraordinary circumstances came back to life. What they report and the striking similarities between them is nothing short of remarkable. Is there an afterlife? Does God exist? What is the meaning of life? Let's find out. Jan, thank you for being here today. It's my pleasure. I'm so glad to be here. Yeah, I'm so glad we we got the opportunity to do this with you. Um, I wanted to kick off this conversation by talking about science um, and kind of what the word science means. Um, Because for years it was thought that you can't study things that exist outside of the physical world. but I think that the field of near-death studies has, has kind of changed everything. Um, and it's kind of hard to express the magnitude of what we're talking about today um, and what it means about the nature of reality, um, how it would affect people's worldviews, um, all of that stuff. Um, so can you explain to me what science is and how the near, uh, field of near-death experiences, uh, field of near-death studies fits into that? Mm-hmm. Well, um, my understanding of science is that it's the process of creating hypotheses that um, this is related to this or this causes that, and then uh, examining the evidence that either supports or refutes the hypothesis. Mm. And so, um, of course, it's easiest to do that with the material world because we can observe things and and, uh, see repeated processes that confirm or disconfirm hypotheses. Um, But uh, actually, that can happen with the unseen world as well. And so, for example, uh, when people have near-death experiences, uh, they they report a a pattern. uh, what, What we now know is a pattern. And, and we know of that pattern because of the scientific method, because we've studied now thousands of people who've had this experience. And when we look at their narratives uh, collectively, we see, mm. see these patterns. Yeah, I think one thing, <clears throat> objection, um, maybe from people that uh, are, con- are considering this subject for the first time um, and the role of science is the idea that you know, we think about controlled experiments, which, as we'll talk about probably later, like have been um, tried to be conducted with with NDEs, but people thinking that the idea that because you can't necessarily study metaphysical things um, in like a lab with like controlled experiments, that makes it like unscientific. People don't really realize that there are kind of many fields that people accept as science that it's virtually impossible to do lab experiments. Yeah, it was in Dr. Bruce Gason's book. He said um, very few topics of scientific research can be studied with controlled experiments, and there are many fields that everyone accepts as science, even though laboratory experiments are difficult, if not impossible. Fields like astronomy, evolutionary biology, geology, and paleontology. Um, Another kind of, I guess you could call it criticism, is that... NDEs have been talked about as like anecdotes. Can you speak to that kind of feedback on yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. The the term anecdote is kind of a diminishing term because yeah. it makes it sound like it was just this fluky thing that happened, uh, as opposed to uh, there's a book uh, that the International Association for Near Death Studies has recently issued the second edition called The Self Does Not Die. Yeah. And it's about uh, the phenomenon of veridical perception that I know we're going to be getting into here. Yeah. And um, and in we made the, the um, very purposeful decision to refer to cases because we investigated each of these cases, and uh, the only cases included in the book are those that have at least one 
credible witness to verify besides the near-death experiencer mm, themselves. So, um, so uh, we we purposely avoided that term anecdote because yeah. of its you know diminishing implication. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's a there's a few components or ideas, if you will. I feel like that are essential to scientific discovery, um, which involves obviously examination of evidence um, through rigorous observation, and then also the idea of like sound reasoning um, being incorporated in that. And so I think what's interesting about this conversation, obviously there's, there's like really big um, things at play here, like material world, metaphysical things. Um, but in terms of the scientific mindset, obviously it, it's inherently skeptical, which I think is a great thing, obviously. Um, I think mm -hmm. not accepting things at face value based on little to no evidence is important. Yeah. Um, and I think it, it helps us establish fact versus fiction. Um, and as well as the governing processes of like the entire world. And so like that process has helped get us to today. But I think one of the more ironic parts of this conversation is that when, whether it's scientists or just people in general, avoid talking about the incredible evidence that we're, we're about to get into, um, it's actually like in a way unscientific because yeah. we're not using the same type of mindset when it That's comes to right. this stuff. So, Yeah, um, science in, in the Western world has largely become equivalent to materialism, the belief that everything has a physical basis mm. and, um, and, that, and physicalism, that, that everything can be explained through physical processes. And so if one starts from that assumption then uh, topics like this are just uh, off, off base or off uh, limits yeah. to you know, be, be researched. Yeah. Um, but if one starts from a truly scientific basis of um, creating and, and then examining the evidence for hypotheses, then uh, topics like this are included. And so uh, that's why it's important for people to realize that uh, materialism, as valuable as it is, I mean, it, materialist thinking has led to amazing things, you know, antibiotics, yeah. and that I probably yeah. wouldn't be here today mm. if it weren't for the discoveries that arose out of materialism, and that it also is an incomplete explanation for everything that we know happens. Yeah. And so it's important for people to be able to make that distinction. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the idea of like studying things that don't fit our preconceived like ideas is is what um, drives like breakthroughs in science. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm excited to, to get into that. So, so let's talk about the field, the field of near death studies. Uh, now it's been almost 50 years, um, has a rich history. Um, so, so what is it and how did it start? Well, in 1975, Raymond Moody, who was at the time a medical student, he's now a psychiatrist, uh, and he also has a doctorate in philosophy, um, wrote the book Life After Life based on his interviews of over 100 people who had had this experience that he, in that book, he dubbed the term near-death experience. That's what he called it. Mm. And that term has pretty much stuck with it uh, over these many decades. And, uh, and in the book, he identified uh, patterns of um, the experience and after effects. Mm. And, um, and essentially, in the intervening... Excuse me, I have to clear my throat. <clears> throat> Yeah. So, and essentially in the intervening time, um, all the research that's been done, essentially for the very most part, just confirms what he said in that book. Mm. Um, but confirms it through, you know, he did, uh, he, his book was not based on what we would consider rigorous research. Yeah. But that research has been done since then and, and confirms what he observed. The reason that these experiences have become um, so visible is uh, advances in resuscitation technology mm. during the 20th yeah. century. 
and we are bringing people back from the brink of death in numbers just unprecedented in history. So the opportunity for people to have near-death experiences also increased with that. And uh, we now know that these experiences have occurred throughout history and across cultures, but, um, but obviously in greater numbers recently. So what is a near-death experience? What happens in a near-death experience is essentially during... Uh, usually during a close brush with death, and I can come back to that point in a minute, um, the person perceives their consciousness to be functioning apart from their physical body, observing the material world, perceiving the material world, because they not only see and hear, but they also like know what people are thinking and can see distance, um, mm. things that are you know outside of their normal visual range and things like that, um, and, all, and or perceiving and interacting with entities and environments that are not of the material world. Yeah. So um, typically in a, in a complete near-death experience, um, the person let, might be, for example, on the operating table anesthetized and being operated on, and suddenly they are conscious and outside of their body, usually above, looking down on the scene. A favorite location is a ceiling corner of mm. the room. And um, watching as the surgery is going on on their body. And uh, in some cases, the this is happening while they're in cardiac arrest. They suddenly go into cardiac arrest. Um, they become conscious outside their body, watches the the medical team is screwing around, um, res you know, doing the resuscitation. And, uh, and then in a, as I said, like a really complete experience, the person might leave the, uh, the operating room, go to other parts of the hospital, like th think um, while the person's in the state of consciousness, movement occurs kind of like at the speed of thought. Yeah. So they might think, uh, oh, they know that they're, spouse is waiting in the waiting room wondering you know how they're doing the moment they think of that person zoom, they're in the waiting room watching as the spouse is there sitting looking really nervous in the chair or yeah. you know whatever and uh and then uh the per the person's consciousness might leave the hospital go to other places um in the material world and then might also uh at some point find themselves often there's this kind of transition thing of that involves rapid movement through space uh, sometimes through a structure like a, a tunnelish kind of structure mm. and uh, and at the end of that space they find themselves in a non-material environment and uh, that might be like this preternatural kind of thing where it's it's like a beautiful garden and there are mm. colors and um, and uh, every blade of grass has consciousness and just kind of different things than happens in the material world colors that that uh, the pr ND ear will say they never saw on earth yeah. and things like that and they may meet um, entities that are not of the material world it might be deceased loved ones uh, it might be other people that um, they don't realize at the time is a yeah. deceased loved one, but discover later. And, um, and it might be other spiritual entities, sometimes identifiable like Jesus, but sometimes uh, an entity that just seems to be like a spirit guide or an angel yeah. or something like that. Yeah, I think what's, what's interesting when you're talking about the resuscitation technology, um, Dr. Sam Parnia, who's a doctor here in New York, um, he, he wrote, when the experience occurs in the circumstances of cardiac arrest and the objective period of death, I think near-death experience would more accurately be termed the actual death experience or ADE. Um, so I think, you know, people who are listening, we're coming from a materialistic worldview, like immediately we try to reconcile what you're talking about in a psychological framework. We talked about this last night, but I think for some people it might matter. Like sometimes these people are dead for 
minutes. I mean, in one book I was reading about, I don't know how verifiable this one was. There was someone who was dead for about eight hours. Um, can you speak to like the ranges of how long people were dead um, for that you've seen? Mm -hmm. People tend to be most convinced when the person was um, in cardiac arrest, no heartbeat, no breathing for some period of time. And what they observed seems to have occurred during the time that they were, because um, cardiologists uh, like Pim Van Lammel tell us that after 20 seconds of the heart not beating, there's no more measurable brain activity. Mm. So if the brain is not functioning, and yet the person later reports things that happened during that time that they perceived from this position outside their body, yeah. it just um, challenges everything we believe about, you know, it, it, it certainly challenges what materialists believe that conscious experience can only be the result of, of the brain, of brain activity. Yeah. So um, uh, one of my favorite NDEs, uh, for a couple of reasons, one is that it's a, a woman who's a, um, a, a very successful surgeon in Wyoming. Her name's Mary Neal. And she drowned in a um, kayaking mishap uh, in Central or South America. Um, and uh, she was un her body was underwater for about a half hour. And you go, like, when this happens, right, it's like you go brain dead in, what, minutes or right. something? Right, well, that, that, as I said, Pim Van Lammel says after 20 seconds of no, no uh, respiration there isn't enough oxygen for the brain to function. So there's no measurable brain activity. Okay. Yeah, so so 30 minutes underwater um, and uh, and she, in a, you know, making a much longer and more fascinating story very short, she made a full recovery mm. after this. And she had a profound near-death experience in which she observed many things that um, happened um, that, uh, you know, she shouldn't have known about yeah. except that she saw it. Yeah. That's really fascinating. I think, you know, we're going to, we're going to talk about like the biology of dying. Um, but I think what's so fascinating is when we talk about the idea of like anecdotes, right. Um, and like being stories, um, there's another, this is another quote from Grayson. He was saying, most research starts with scientists collecting, verifying, comparing anecdotes until patterns in these stories become apparent. And then from those patterns emerge hypotheses, which can be tested and refined. And so I think what's remarkable about the field of near-death studies is that so many people, thousands upon thousands of people, have come forward essentially all saying the same thing. Um, and so there are the aspects of near-death experiences that are verifiable like objectively but even when it comes to the personal element of these stories the sheer number of them um, presents a case on its own for what they say that they've seen um, so I think that that is like really interesting in itself and so um, you know Moody and others obviously were at the forefront of starting this in the 1970s but there's been tons of books research papers um, and models to created to, to explain this phenomenon. Um, so you're the president of the International Association of Near-Death Studies, and you're also the editor of the Journal of Near-Death Studies, which is a um, scholarly journal. So can you tell me about the, uh, the association first, like what, what that is and how that's been established? Sure. Well, <clears throat> shortly after uh, Raymond's book, um, a few researchers uh, became really interested in near-death experiences and uh, found that there was no um, vehicle for them to associate with each other, you know, yeah. communicate and so forth. So they founded the International Association for Near-Death Studies, and mm. it was founded by, uh, by academics and medical professionals. Uh, Bruce Grayson, John Adet. Uh, Bruce is a psychiatrist. Uh, John Adet, and then Michael Sabom is a uh, cardiologist, and Ken Ring is a social psychologist. And um, and and as part of the organization, they. 
founded the Journal of Near-Death Studies. So the organization was really founded on research, and, um, and they founded the journal because they found that their, their research in this area, a lot of journals wouldn't publish it just because of a prejudice against you know, studying something that's unseen. Yeah. And, uh, and they wanted to create a scholarly outlet. Um, since that time, uh, there are like hundreds of journals that have published research on near-death experience, so it's become much more accepted mm. academically. Um, so that's uh, that's really gratifying yeah. uh, for for the the founders. Um, since that time, the association has branched out also into uh, education about NDEs and support for people mm. who've near, had near-death and related experiences. So um, we have um, sharing groups, both in person and online, for people who've had these kinds yeah. of experiences or have personal or professional interest. And, um, and we do a conference every year uh, that we're now, that the worst of COVID is over. We're back to in-person. Yeah. It's always been the week of, uh, the weekend of Labor Day. Yeah. Uh, around the country, and we have a spring symposium that's online on a really um, specific topic yeah. in this area. So, uh, so we're doing you know just lots of things uh, in addition to research now. Yeah, for people that are obviously not in the scientific community, can you explain like why a scholarly uh, journal is important in the sense that it's like peer reviewed. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, yeah. yeah. So peer review refers to that when I receive a manuscript that of somebody that wants to publish their work in the journal, I send it out to at least two reviewers. I have a, a panel of uh, people who are expert in the mm. field of near-death studies, and I send it out to, to each of them to review it. And then they send their review back to me, which is, you know, criticisms, suggestions, and and even just assessing whether the the topic is appropriate for the journal and that sort of thing. And then um, I, uh, depending on what they recommend, they can recommend that the um, manuscript be accepted just as it is, which is extremely rare, or that there be minor uh, revisions and mm. then acceptance, or major revisions, or reject it. Yeah. And so uh, I use that um, I give that feedback to the uh, the author or authors. It's all anonymous, so um, they don't know, uh, the reviewers don't know who the authors are, the authors don't know who the reviewers are. I'm the only one who knows both of those. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so that people can be honest, and um, as the reviewers in particular yeah. can be honest. And um, so that... That process is the way any scholarly peer-reviewed journal yeah. functions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say that. I mean, this is like kind of a standard yeah. process across all science. Like, for example, if there was a journal around neuroscience, you'd have peer-reviewed uh, like exactly. of, of expert neuroscientists that were like reviewing like the, the research. And so, yeah, I think that's fascinating. Um, one of the big things with this field, which I think is amazing, is one of the greatest gaps in science is the lack of understanding about metaphysical matters in the sense that like thoughts or emotions, like what are thoughts or emotions? And with neuroscience, we can observe through brain scans, like physically what's happening there. But, um, you know, kind of the, the unknown is like, we don't have an idea of how like a physical event, like an electrical current or chemical change in a nerve can produce consciousness. Right. Um, yeah, that's uh, referred to as the hard question of consciousness. Studies. Yeah. Yeah. And so I feel like this field of near-death studies like helps fill in those gaps, which we're going to get into. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot of alternative explanations for what, has hap what, what is happening with near-death experiences. Um, throughout all the literature that I've read, I don't know, there's like seven, eight different theories. Even if you go on the Wikipedia pages, you'll see certain things pop up. Um, can you explain to me, like, what are some of the popular ones and why they don't work? Yeah, so I'm going to have to dig deep because uh, to, to jump to the end of this, no explanation 
has been generated that fits the evidence. And there are always exceptions. So for example, uh, people say that um, maybe the person is generating these memories um, while they're losing consciousness, while they're regaining consciousness, but not really having the experience while they're, for those people who lost consciousness, while they were unconscious. And, um, and that one gets refuted by cases where people are perceiving things that happened in the middle of a, a you know, substantial period of consciousness of a few minutes. Mm. And, um, and uh, people say, well, maybe, maybe the person, you know, if, if someone reports something that they saw that's later verified as accurate, maybe they heard medical personnel talking about this, yeah. you know, while they were like in the process of being anesthetized or while they were in the recovery room and they don't remember where they actually got that information from, they think that they, they kind of reconstructed in their mind as something they observed when it was really something they heard third hand. And the problem is that we've got lots of cases where people perceive things that it's just, it's just stretch is it's too much of a stretch to think that people even would have talked yeah. about this. Yeah. You know, so, um, so those, you know, there, as you say, there are seven or eight theories out there that they're just exceptions that, um, that make those theories untenable. Yeah. Another one is just like, I think it's called expectation theory. Yes. What is, what is that one? Well, the, that people will see what they expect to see. And yeah. that's, and that's refuted by all the cases where people saw things they didn't expect. Yeah. Um, for example, uh, one gal, her name's Trisha, uh, she had, uh, her near death experience, um, during surgery following a really awful car accident when she was 20. And um, when during her near-death experience, uh, I'm only giving you a tiny little piece of what happened to illustrate this, she um, left the surgery area, her, her body was being operated on, and she left the area and, uh, and went to the waiting room where her mother was, saw her mother praying and could hear what her mother was saying in her wow. prayers, uh, even though she was praying silently. And then she, and then Trisha wondered, like, where's my stepfather? And boom, she goes to this other part of the hospital, and she sees him standing at a vending machine, inserting a quarter and getting out a candy bar. And she's like, whoa, that's weird, because her parents were um, like health food nuts, yeah. and they never ate refined sugar. And uh, and it was later verified that he he was just so nervous that he just broke down and had a candy bar. And um, so it, it defied her expectation. Um, and there's no way, like literally there's no way she would have known that information. Like they were in other rooms. And, but then there's a corroborative aspect of that. Right. In the sense that they themselves like, confirmed that that's what was that's happening later. Right. That's right. And so yeah. that's what I find yeah. to be remarkable. Yeah. And so, so we can't, we can't uh, attribute what people experience to expectation. There are yeah. just lots and lots of cases where people expected different things. In fact, I, I joke and say, you can think what you believe about what's going to happen when you die, but here's what really happens, yeah. you know, that, that um, may or may not conform to your expectations. Yeah. Yeah. I think to understand some of this, you have to understand like kind of the biology of dying. So what does it mean to be dead? Well, you know, this is where I, I have maybe a different view than some people like, like Sam Parnia. Um, I think of death as the irreversible state. So when a person reaches a point where they cannot be resuscitated, mm. they're dead. Yeah. Anything short of that, I consider to be near death. So they may be in the first moments of death, the first... Um, so they're beginning. temporarily dead. They're temporarily dead. Yeah. And they're really dead. I mean, yeah. but only temporarily. <laughs> they're like dead, dead. And yeah, yeah <laughs> not, they're not like dead, dead. Exactly. And so if they can be resuscitated, then in my view, they're near death. And so, um, but it is a process and that, that takes um, actually hours. You know, there's research now showing that um, there's sometimes spontaneous little firing of, mm. of, 
things even hours after a person is pronounced yeah. permanently dead. Um, uh, but those are really random, small things. They're not um, the kind of activity that we would expect to see when someone is generating uh, complex, yeah. lucid perceptions like people report during near-death experiences. Well, what would you say that makes me think, what would you say to the people that would say that these experiences are the function of just of the dying brain, of like images or things that the dying brain is generating? Yeah, well, um, you know, there, there, first of all, that question is based on the assumption that the brain produces consciousness, yeah. which that's, that is what near-death experiences kind of defy, is that... Um, that uh, people have these experiences while their brains are presumably not functioning at all, yeah. you know, well into cardiac arrest, for example. So, um, so the brain isn't like, I mean, it's, it may be dying in the sense of final inactivity of the cells, but in terms of the, it, the brain functioning in to any degree that we would expect to be associated with these kinds of complex, lucid experiences, it just it doesn't explain how that could happen. It yeah. defies that model. So what happens to the brain at death? Within about 20 seconds of the heart stopping beating and, and respiration stopping, the brain shows no measurable activity. Now, there may still be... Um, low level, kind of like equivalent to a car idling, you know, for some period of time, but not the kind of uh, activity that could make the car mm. move, yeah. you know. And, and then over uh, the, you know, as the minutes go by, more and more brain cells just die and become yeah. inactive and un, unresuscitatable. Yeah. One of the things that uh, Dr. Jeffrey Long, who obviously is one of the, the kind of leading researchers and, and doctors in this field, he said like, mm -hmm. that there's no chance with a flat EEG that electrical activity in the lower parts of the brain could account for kind of the, the highly lucid and ordered experience that, that is described um, through NDEs. Exactly. So yep. one thing that we've kind of been alluding to at this point um, is that while all near-death experiences are valid, um, there are some that um, fit into the cases that are evidential um, mm -hmm. because they can, especially if they're happening under like scientific evaluation in an operating room and people are reporting things. Um, and I think these are fascinating because in these instances, there's seems to be no logical alternative scientific explanation for what these people like reported. Um, and so I want to get into that a little bit. Um, you are kind of one of the leader, leading researchers in, in, the, in the field of kind of um, vertical perception. Mm -hmm. um, and so I find this to be like remarkable, like such a huge discovery. Like if you think about like science and you know things that have been discovered the past 50 years, I don't know what trumps this. And so can you tell me what vertical perception is mm -hmm. um, and, sure. and what happens there. Yeah, so the word veridical is the, the closest meaningful word for people is verifiable. Uh, so in other words, during the near-death experience, the person perceives something that they later report and is then verified as having been accurate. And, um, and in some cases, you know, it's possible to explain away um, what the person saw, but in many cases, it's not. And so, um, so the cases that are mo most convincing are those where there are at least one other credible witness who can verify that what the person saw was correct. So like one of my favorites is um, a, a case that Bruce Grayson described in his book, After, which I highly recommend for people interested in this subject. And, um, and he himself was the investigator of the case, so he can speak very 
authoritatively about it. And what happened from his point of view is that a, um, a nurse called him one day and said, we have a patient who had one of those experiences that you studied, and would you come over and, and interview them? So he immediately goes over. This person had just um, come out of uh, surgery and had regained consciousness and, and described what happened during the surgery. And that uh, what happened was that he, uh, he the patient, had uh, gone into cardiac arrest, and he was outside his body watching, and he saw his surgeon, whom he knew, he knew the surgeon, but he saw the surgeon like flapping his arms as if trying to fly. Mm. And, and so Bruce is like taking notes and he's like, okay, you know, that's weird. Um, so then Bruce went and interviewed, he, he started with the uh, people who were uh, kind of the low level people and, and worked his way up to the actual surgeon himself. And everybody, he were, interviewed them all individually, and everybody said the same thing. Oh, yeah, Dr. So-and-so, yeah, he, he, like, does that. Then when Bruce got to the surgeon, and he said, you know, the patient described this, and the surgeon kind of laughed, and he said, yeah, he said, well, the surgeon had been trained internationally, and there they train people. After you anesthetize your hands, you put them on your sterile gown, and you back into the operating room and you keep your hands here until your assistants have done all the opening and everything and it's time for you to do your stuff. Then you, then you take your hands down. Mm. Well, while he was standing there that day, the patient went into cardiac arrest. So he's saying, get that scalpel, move that tray, you know, do this, do that. He's, he's using his elbows to point and tell his, his assistants what to do. Yeah. So to the, to the NDE ear, it looked like he was like flapping his arms as if trying to fly, uh, but he was using his elbows to point. And a very idiosyncratic thing for yeah. this surgeon. No other surgeon does that because no other surgeon had been trained and where this, this and the guy was had. under the guy was under cardiac arrest, so it literally would be impossible for him to know that. You would think that because not only is he fully anesthetized, remember that that they always tape the eyes shut because mm -hmm. uh, we don't blink when we're under full anesthesia, so you have to keep the eyes moist. So his eyes are taped shut, and um, and so he could maybe hear, you know, it, at most physically he could hear things going on. But how would he see this, which makes no noise? Yeah, you know. So, um, so he's fully anesthetized. He's in cardiac arrest. His heart is not working. Presumably, his brain isn't functioning within 20 seconds. Uh, at least, no mem no measurable activity. Um, how in the world could he have seen this? Yeah. Except that his consciousness truly was outside his body, observing yeah. the material world. Yeah. And and in the book, The Self Does Not Die, it's a collection of over 100 cases, in fact, over 130 cases um, like this, where the researchers have verified, have gone to um, uh, the surgeons uh, or gone to, in, in most of the cases, the credible witness is a surgeon or another medical professional who was yeah. involved in the situation. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, in simplest terms, when we talk about vertical perception, essentially the idea we're getting at is like someone floating outside of their body um, and being able to observe their body while they're not in their body. Um, and so, again, Dr. Jeffrey Long, um, he did a study about 1,300 NDEs and 75.4% of the people had this experience of, of floating outside their body. Yeah. One of the ones I, cases I thought was just kind of insane was a kind of an early often cited account of Kimberly Clark. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about that one? Yeah, sure. She was a social worker at a hospital in Washington state and a woman, I believe it was a woman, was brought in uh, in cardiac arrest. And uh, once the woman was in the hospital, they resuscitated her, which is pretty r unusual. Um, but it did happen in her case. And um, she, when she regained consciousness after this was all over, and Kimberly was a social worker just to come and see how she was doing, she told Kimberly that outside of the hospital, she had seen, because uh, when the ambulance was coming in, she was 
outside of her body following the ambulance. And she could see the hospital from the outside and on a ledge at a, a floor above where she was, uh, the emergency room is always on ground level, um, she saw a, a shoe on the ledge, on a, a window ledge. And it was a particular color. It was turned upside down. There was a shoelace kind of hanging off the edge uh, that was a particular color. And um, she told Kimberly this, and Kimberly was like, you know, okay. But then uh, it was kind of bothering her. So she went up to the floor that the woman said that it was on, like the fourth floor. And she just would go into each hospital room and kind of say to the patients, excuse me, I'm just just need to look out your window for a second. And she'd go look, you know, and, and she, about the fifth or sixth room she came to, she looked and there was a shoe. Mm. And so then she had a maintenance person come and retrieve it. And it was, and she uh, had the wherewithal to be a little bit scientific. And she had it behind her back. She went back and talked to the person and said, now tell me again, you know, what kind of shoe it was, the colors and all this kind of stuff. And, and then she said, is this the shoe? And the woman's like, yes, that's it. You know, that's the one I saw. So she, the woman had never been up to that floor of the hospital. Yeah. And, um, and, to, and, and her body had been in an ambulance until they, you know, got to the emergency room doors and opened and her body went in. So she never saw the exterior of the hospital physically. Yeah. Um, so it's like, and, and nobody kind of had noticed that the shoe was there or they would have removed it. Yeah. How the shoe got there, we don't know. But, um, but yeah. in any case, it was, you know, a verified experience. Yeah, because, you know, the, the materialist in me would, would start, you know, because again... You hear these things, and then you you run to okay. Let me Could explain it? this. It's like okay, so maybe she was up on that floor earlier. She saw the shoe, and now she's set telling that. But then I think you know, almost when you have the visual of a um, ambulance coming into the hospital, literally you can't see out of the ambulance as a person, right, and right. now you're coming and you're going into a floor. And clearly she hasn't been to that floor. She right. saw nothing. And right. then she's telling that afterwards. It's just right. Right. mind-boggling. Right. And it's not as if she'd driven by the hospital the you know, day before or anything like that. She'd never been near, no. near the hospital before. So, um, yeah. So, and there, there's, you know, another case is, uh, again, a physician. I like, I like cases involving physicians because they're, they tend to be very trusted Mm -hmm. And so they're trusted as credible witnesses. And uh, this is Tom Ofterhide. I believe he's in uh, he's an emergency room physician in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And but when he was in um, medical school, he was just starting out new. He was being supervised by a um, an experienced physician. And one day, um, he, this man came in in cardiac arrest and. Uh, and his supervising physician was nowhere to be found, and he was kind of desperate and um, uncertain about what to do, but he did his best, and indeed the man survived, but he didn't regain consciousness for a couple of days. So every day Tom would go in and check on him. Well, one day he went in, and um, the man was still unconscious. Uh, his lunch had been delivered. Tom hadn't eaten in ages, so he sat there and ate the patient's lunch, and then he left. And the next day, or after the day after, the patient regained consciousness. When Tom walked in, he said, ah, you know, I know you. And Tom's like, uh, and, and he says, yeah, yeah. He said, you owe me a lunch. Mm. <laughs> and, um, and, and then he said, and also, um, I just want you to know that um, you did fine, even though you were really anxious that your supervising physician wasn't around. You did great with me. And Tom is like, this man knew my thoughts. Tom never voiced to anybody that he was anxious and actually kind of mad at yeah. his supervisor for not being there to help him. And uh, But the patient heard his thoughts and, and knew... Um, you know, knew what he had been experiencing um, silently. So, and that's not unusual. That, yeah. So, you know, people who are in uh, medical situations need to be careful what they think yeah. because patients might. <laughs> yeah. I cited the stats from Dr. Long, but uh, Dr. Grayson also had reported 80% of his subjects 
um, had experience in this. And, and just to kind of recount it for the audience, so you have these conditions when people are basically incapacitated um, or verified clinically dead. Um, and so they're not able to see or perceive anything. And so then they're floating outside their body. Um, they're reporting floating through walls. They're all these different things that they're reporting. And then the evidential aspect of it is the cross uh, corroboration and the verification from other people that that is actually like what was happening in the room, which I just find to be so remarkable. <clears throat> yeah. And, and, uh, again, to refer to this book, The Self Does Not Die. Yeah, go buy read, the book. Read, yeah, go buy the book. To read one case after another where, like you said, if you tend, if you think, well, I wonder if this could be explained this way, it's kind of like, it doesn't, then you read another case and another case, and these are from physicians, primarily physicians uh, and medical personnel from all over the country and all over the world who have these experiences very isolated and report them and then uh, only then discover that other people have had similar experiences. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely buy that book, I think, because, yeah, when you're reading, like you're trying to explain away from a materialist standpoint, okay, this one, this one, no, next one, next one, next one. And so like the mounting of evidence of this with cross corroboration is just so overwhelming. It's yeah. it's literally insane. And so you actually directly conducted a study where you um, reviewed reports of out of body perceptions and then um, basically examined how accurate what they reported was. Can yes. you tell me a little bit about that? Because sure. that, that's been cited in so many different books at this point. So. Yeah. Well, um, a researcher named Keith and why I'm blanking on his last name, had written an article about what he called um, erroneous um, perceptions mm. from, of this type and, and was arguing that, therefore, um, this, you know, this must all be nonsense. Which essentially means that what they were seeing was not correct. Was not and correct. And they got it wrong. Yes. Exactly. And, um, and he had, I believe, five cases. He might have had six. And... Um, and so when I read this, I was kind of like taken aback because it was like I hadn't really thought in an organized way about this, but but I definitely had the impression that there were a lot of cases where what people perceived was accurate and what they perceived was contradicted their expectations. It might be very idiosyncratic stuff that they couldn't possibly have imagined. Mm. And I, I it just got me really curious. So it so happened that um, the universe brought me a, a young woman from uh, Switzerland who was doing her uh, um, master's thesis, and, and she just came and lived with me for three months. And hmm. while I went off to the university, she went through all my library to find cases where people supposedly perceive things from the material world that were later um, either corroborated or not. Yeah. And what, what I found was, first of all, I found one more case that he hadn't even found that involved um, uh, error. But I found so many more, like more than 90% of the cases yeah. were accurate. And, um, and, and I was very like um, persnickety about what would be, that if there was any error whatsoever. For example, this woman... Uh, had a near-death experience while she was uh, doing a, a an international business stint that mm. involved several months. And while she was gone, her brother had enlisted in the service, and uh, and which she didn't know. And uh, when she um, and he all and he had um, uh, been fatally wounded and died before she was notified. She had her near-death experience shortly after this, after he died and before she had been notified in the, in the material world. So in her experience, she saw her brother in his uh, military outfit. And um, she saw, you know, that he had these medals and other kinds of things on his, uh, on his uniform. So um, when her business, and then of course she was later 
uh, not long after that, notified by our family that mm. he had died in, in combat. And so when she got home, uh, she saw for the first time a photo of him in his uh, uniform. Wow. And everything was exactly as she had seen, except where she had seen a medal or where she had seen a cross, a Christian cross, was actually a medal. Mm. I counted that as an error. All the positive stuff, that's fine, but if yeah. she anything was wrong, I counted it as an error. And even then, with that stringent criterion, I found so few that involved error yeah. of any kind. And so, um, so the vast majority of these cases are involve yeah. accurate perception. Yeah, I, so I just want to recount the data again just to, to for the audience. So again, the two things we referenced, 75 to 80% people, floating outside their body, completely incapacitated or clinically dead. Um, and then they're describing what they're seeing. Um, and then this study that you directly conducted, 92% of them were completely accurate of things right. that would literally be impossible for them to understand, which is just just mind-blowing to me. Yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of words um, thrown around like consciousness, um, mind, body, spirit. Um, so kind of just to, to tie this up, do you, do you feel like based on your decades of studies and research, has science proven that we have a soul? I'm, I'm a little reluctant to use the word soul because it's associated with religion. Mm -hmm. And um, I prefer to use the word consciousness, that, um, that we each have a unique consciousness and that uh, what veridical perception indicates is that uh, our con we have a con consciousness that can function independent of the physical brain. Mm -hmm. And then the implication of that is that um, that consciousness might have preceded our physical incarnation. It might survive our physical demise. And so the implication is a, um, an eternal consciousness. But the part that has been um, indicated through scientific research so far is just the fact that consciousness can function apart from the physical brain. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, the, the biggest piece of that, again, materialist worldview is that the brain produces the mind, right? So if you're, if you're saying that the brain produces the mind, um, and that they're the same thing, um, this um, is kind of, and all the researchers and scientists that are in this field is kind of proving that the mind is separate from the brain or that yeah. the brain actually act, acts as a filter for the mind. Yes. Would both. that be correct? Yes, both. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So to, <clears throat> so to um, just take what you said a little bit further, the implication of the materialist view that uh, that the brain produces consciousness, the implication is that then when the brain becomes non-functioning, consciousness also will just disappear. Yeah. Because, you know, if, it, if the brain produces it and the brain is offline, then consciousness can't happen. Um, so this, what this indicates is that consciousness is essentially independent of the brain, but obviously closely connected while we're physically alive to the brain. Yeah. Because we know that, you know, there when I think something that's going to show with EEG, you know, activity and there's a definite correlation between my conscious experience and brain activity. Yeah. Um it's just that uh what these ex veridical perception indicates is that consciousness can function without brain activity. Mm. And uh so yeah. So then, then as I said, the implication is that uh, that consciousness can continue um, it once the brain is absolutely, completely, irreversibly dead. Mm. We're just just scratching the surface of yeah. what is actually going on here. And so, you know, you have the the vertical perception, which is evidential, um, cross corroborated, all of that things. And then there are a number of 
I think Dr. Jeffrey Long in one of a paper he did recently was there's about 12 different features of what happens next. Um, and so in Grayson's work, he said that 90%, about 90% of his subjects reported um, encountering a being of light, like kind of as a next step of that. And so, and that people said that that was the most meaningful part of their experience. Um, and it seems like everything that I've read, like, every single researcher has reported this with mm -hmm. high frequency. Um, oh, yeah. so, so can you tell me about that a little bit, the, the being of light thing? Sure. Well, the, the being of light, which some people identify as like God, but other people are um, more cautious and just say, you know, here's, here's what I experienced, is this um, light that is profoundly intense and yet does not hurt the person's eyes, so mm. to speak, even though they're not perceiving it with physical eyes and that this light is a like a personality an entity that emanates absolute love um, and and a complete knowing of the near-death experiencer so the experiencer feels absolutely known absolutely loved and it's a, it's a profound experience People typically say a love like I've never experienced on earth. You know, it's, it's, um, and it's, and therefore is very difficult to describe. Mm. Um, often in the presence of this light, the person experiences what's called a life review. Mm. And that's another aspect that they tend to say is most meaningful because what happens in the life review is the person, um, reviews, that is, sees again, and simultaneously re-experiences, and simultaneously observes from a sort of third-person perspective, at typically every moment of their life, and experiences what anybody that they were relating to was, was experiencing. Wow. So, like, if ND ears are right, and we're all going to experience this when we die. Someday you and I will re-experience this moment, and I will know what it is to be you, mm. and you will know what it is to be me. This isn't just like imagining or kind of... It's putting, the ultimate sense of like empathy, right? It's, it's, yeah, it's beyond empathy in the sense that um, it, empathy is in, still involves some imagination, it's a it's an experience of being the other person. Yeah. And um and so when I've been nice to somebody, I experience what it was like that for niceness them to did for them. That, yes. Right. When I've been mean to somebody, I experience what that meanness was for them. And um and that has a as you can imagine, a profound impact on people when they come back to realize that um we are all connected, and and every and and uh, I should say too that in the life review, a lot of experiencers make the point that uh, they experienced just like how they reacted to somebody when they were going through the checkout line mm. at the grocery store, and that they either said something nice to the checkout person or acted, you know impatient with them and they experienced how that affected them and and how they how they went on to relate to other people as a result and um so to to realize the the awesome responsibility we have in how we relate to each other moment to moment mm. and that um it it goes you know the the golden rule is actually something that is uh universal among all religions, you know, essentially do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. What, what life reviews tell us is that um, there isn't really an other and a you. There is only us. Mm. We're connected. And that when I do unto you, I am doing unto myself. Yeah. Um, and so it's a golden, that it golden has rule, yeah. the golden rule has lots of implications at every level from the moment to moment interactions we have to, you know, the decisions that are made yeah. at, 
you know, the highest levels of government and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I have a couple quotes here about the life review thing from people um, who experienced it Mm -hmm. for a sandwich I want to uh, read off. Um, So one person said, in every scene of my life review, I could feel again what I had felt at various times in my life, which is what you just said. Um, And I could feel everything everyone else felt as a consequence of my actions. Some of it felt good and some of it felt awful. All of this translated into knowledge and I learned, oh, how I learned. And then another person said, in short, the whole of my existence seemed to be placed before me in a kind of panoramic review. And each act seemed to be accompanied by a consciousness of right and wrong. So I think that this finding is uh, fascinating in the sense of like the that actions do have consequences. Yeah. Um, I don't think you need to like uh, necessarily learn about NDs to see see that in in the outward world, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, you know, but this so, brings it home yeah. in a in a, in a very a, real, very and real way. way, right? And that it is, and what a lot of NDEers say it's not just our actions, but even our thoughts can have effects. And so there's this tremendous yeah. sense of responsibility. Yeah. Yeah, I think, and then in terms of the being of light, what I find to be kind of most remarkable about this feature, you know, obviously is how people describe this being. Um, and so whether you're, you're, you're calling it, uh, calling it being God or, or, or creator or, or whatnot, um, I, there's been so many debates throughout history about the nature of what created us or, or the source of what created us. Um, and I think some of the theories have to do with like a distance or a detachment from the actual creation or from earth or the universe. Um, but I just find it so remarkable that they're talking about unconditional love. Um, one person who, uh, basically died in a car crash described this and said, peace, tranquility, harmony, oneness, well-being, unconditional love and acceptance, um, is kind of the characteristics of, of what they felt in the yeah. presence of that being. So Yeah, yeah. And that, uh, you know, a lot of near-death experiencers come back with the conviction that this is the ultimate source yeah. of everything. And that um, that anything that we see in, the, in earthly life that is not an expression of, of that love is just a um, disconnection from what is our true source. Mm. So um, so it there's this conviction that this is this is the essence, this is the yeah. the true nature, uh, fundamental nature of yeah. the of the cosmos. So we have the vertical perception, um, being of light, life review. Um, some of the other features that people have kind of universally reported. Um, pa- they die, they pass through a tunnel, um, and then they end up in basically another realm. Um, and it seems like from everything that I've studied with this, that people say like that they feel like that is more real than this world and yes. that that feels like their home yeah. and that this doesn't feel like their home. That's really interesting to me. Yeah, yeah, it is kind of amazing. And uh, again, a, a very unexpected um, phenomenon for the vast majority of people that uh, they... They experience um, meeting um, non-material entities mm. and being in places that feel like coming home. And uh, a lot of uh, near-death experiencers, again, people who didn't know each other, use that term that they felt like they were home, mm. um, really where they where they belonged. And uh, so for them, it can be very challenging to come back to earthly existence where there isn't unconditional love yeah. and, uh, and there's disconnection from, from that, um, that source of, of such joy and bliss. Yeah. Yeah, I think what's interesting, um, you know, when we talk about evidential corroboration, um, I think the second big thing that has been widely talked about with the NDs um, in terms of what you can verify is people entering this other realm um, and they encounter deceased family, relatives, friends, 
Um, and what's most remarkable is there are some instances where they received information or knew something that happened um, mm-hmm. that literally would have been impossible for them to know. And then they, they when they return back into their bodies um, and then continue on with life, um, they talk about that. Can you, can you talk about that element of, of sure. Vandu? Because the um, veridical material can come from the material world, like the seeing the surgeon do yeah. this, or the transmaterial world. And uh, there are cases, uh, many cases of people who, like the woman I mentioned before, who saw her brother and didn't know that he had died in combat. Mm. Um, there's a, a, a case in The Self Does Not Die where um, this, uh, this was in the days before cell phones. And so the, um, this little boy was seriously ill. He was in the hospital. His parents spent the night at the hospital. And finally, um, and, and during the night, he uh, had a near-death experience. He came back and he said that he saw his older sister who told him that he had to come back, but she was going to stay where, where they met in this transmaterial um, domain. And the parents just thought, you know, he's hallucinating, whatever. So finally, um, he was stabilized, and and the parents decided, you know, we're going to go home and shower and try to get some sleep and stuff. When they got home, they found on their answering machine like 20-some messages from the university where their older daughter was a student, and they were calling to tell the parents that she had died the previous night, just before midnight, oh my gosh. in a car accident. Well, his near-death experience happened in the middle of the night. So he saw her in the transmaterial domain, and she told him, you have to go back, I'm going to stay here. He wasn't hallucinating. He, he um, met someone that had died that nobody in, his, in the material world yet knew, knew that she was dead. That she was dead. So there are lots of cases mm. like that. So the, the, the veridical information can, can come from not just the material world, but also the transmaterial yeah. world. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that, and then what we just talked about with floating outside of our bodies, like those two things are just completely dumbfounding the scientific mm-hmm. community. Yeah. Um, and then with some of these other features, you, ju- you just get the sheer breadth and uh, consistency across people that are experiencing these things. And so when it came to encountering loved ones, um, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Long again, he wrote, um, you know, they generally appear completely healthy, even if they died of a disfiguring accident or illness, um, which is just remarkable because... Mm-hmm let's just say someone had cancer or they had, uh, I don't know, Alzheimer's or something. And then now when they're in this other realm or existence, now you're, you're seeing them fully healthy and thriving once again, um, which is uh, incredible. The other thing um, I thought was really interesting is a sense in alteration of time. Mm-hmm. Um, I think time is an is interesting subject in itself. Time <laughs> is in the material world, the linear um, so, you know, I'm in my thirties right now, I'm going to be in my forties and sixties, seventies. Yeah. Um, but it seems like when people die, all sense of time and essence kind of like goes out the window. Mm-hmm. Can you, can you explain yeah. that? Well, one of the key features of near death experience is that, uh, during the experience time either s- speeds up or slows down or loses all meaning. And, um, and if you think about it, Our concept of time is so tied to the earth revolving around the sun and the hours of the day, the days of the week, blah, 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 that um, what if you're out in space and you're no longer, you know, in this this time elapsing um, environment? Mm. And so that's, I think, what happens is that people are free from the material world and the, uh, that what near-death experiencers say and, and other like mystical experiencers and so forth is that time as we think of it doesn't really exist. It's an illusion. And that, uh, that actually everything is happening at once. And, uh, but, but we're 
in on Earth in this, um, as you mentioned before, filtered experience where we, uh, where this illusion becomes a, a mm. reality. Yeah. Yeah. It's like so fascinating. Um, yeah. The other thing is is how people describe their not only heightened senses but also their bodies. Um, and so there's a few characteristics that people um, talk about with like, I don't know if you want to call it upgraded bodies or whatever you want to call it in terms of like how they have a sense of themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and different end of ears have different experiences in this regard. Some perceive that they have a kind of a kind of physical, like their physical body, but but different in um, like maybe being translucent, that sort of thing. Some people perceive themselves as a um, an energetic ball of light, mm. and some some say they just have no form whatsoever. So um, so it can vary from person to person yeah. about, but it's but they certainly perceive themselves to be different than identified with this physical body. Yeah. Yeah. And then what are the other features? Obviously, um, so not all experiences were pleasant. Um, That's right. And uh, which is just an uncomfortable thing to talk about. Um, obviously, the research around the pleasant experience is, um, is exciting. It's I'd love to hear about it. Um, and it's convincing. But then there's like there's there's two places that people go to. One is a pleasurable experience and then the other one is a, a kind of a distressing experience. Can you, and it seems like a, I couldn't really get a, a handle on the exact number, but it seems anywhere from between eight to 23% of people ish mm -hmm. mm -hmm. experiences. Can you tell me about yeah. what that is, what's going on there? Yeah. So, um, and, and that's right. Eight to 23. Uh, what I like to say is a, a, just a general, um, concept is maybe 10% ish hmm. and it could be a little higher, a little lower. Um, and, and we're, we can't know because some people don't want to talk about the experience. It's so upsetting to them, yeah. but, uh, so we, it's kind of hard to know, but that's a good, you know, general guess. And, um, what we know again from research is that distressing experiences take one of three forms. The most common form has all the same features as a pleasurable experience, except that the the experiencer is resisting. They don't want, they find themselves moving rapidly through a tunnel. They don't want to move through, you know, the, they're digging in their heels. And, um, and in many of those cases, the experiencer gets to a point where they just decide to surrender, and then the experience turns pleasurable. Surrender to what? Surrender to the experience. Rather than resist it, they just kind of like relax and okay, whatever. And then the experience turns pleasurable. So, um, that doesn't happen in every case, but in many, in many of that type of cases, the second type of distressing experience. Now I'm going from most frequently reported that I just described. Yeah. Next least frequently described is an experience where the person finds themselves out in a void, absolutely alone, forever. So it's this experience of absolute eternal isolation. And it is, for the experiencers who've experienced it, terrifying, uh, because they're co fully conscious of being absolutely alone forever. And that, that the awareness of their absolute isolation is um, is what they have, mm. and um, and then and I can tell you a, a story about um, one of those cases. But uh, to go on, just to give the overview, least frequently reported is an experience of um, some kind of torment, where the person is um, experiencing pain and suffering. Uh, that is, you know, happening, uh, being put on them. Uh, and so, um, so the, these, you know, what might be called hellish experiences, although 
I've only seen, out of all the cases that I've read and people that I've talked with, I've only seen one case where there was actually hellfire, you know, that that kind of um, hellfire and damnation sort yeah. of view of, of, uh, of hell. Um, it's It more often takes the form of, for example, Matthew Davell and his near-death experience, uh, part of it was that he was... Um, experiencing it was kind of like the his life review he was experiencing everybody he had ever hurt appear come and bump up against him they bump chests with them and when that happened he would relive how he had hurt them mm. and that went on he said for th- uh, three days and three nights during during his experience and uh, it just one after another, and it was absolutely excruciating. Um, another near-death experiencer had an experience of being sort of um, uh, um, violated by evil entities, like their flesh ripped and uh, their you know trans material flesh ripped and that sort of thing. So. Um, uh, interestingly, in both of those cases, it doesn't always happen. But um, once again, uh, there are many of those cases where the person uh, eventually calls out with absolute sincerity to be saved, um, mm-hmm. sometimes by Jesus or sometimes by some other benevolent entity. And when that happens, the experience ends and their experience turns blissful. Mm. It doesn't happen for everybody, but again, in many cases. Yeah. And the same thing with the void kind of thing. Oh, uh, the crying out. Yeah, Yeah, that there, there can be an outcry for, for help and deliverance. Um, but one of the things that we know from research is that even people who've had distressing NDEs end up having the same positive after effects as people who had pleasurable NDEs. Uh, people, we haven't gotten into after effects very much yet, but you know, people become more loving, less concerned about materialism, more concerned about the well-being so it's of like a wake-up others call. and that sort of thing. So for many people, not again, not everybody, but the I would say the great majority of people who have distressing experiences, it's like a wake-up mm-hmm. call, a course correction yeah. in their life. And and I think of it often as an analogy. I'm not a parent actually, but I know a lot about parenting because of being a, a counseling uh, professor that um, sometimes... Some children are responsive to benevolent love, like if you just look at them, you know, a little, they kind of straighten yeah. up and fly, right? Others need tough love. And I think uh, my, my personal observation is that there's a higher wisdom at work, like whatever that person is needing for their spiritual development is what they get. Yeah. And so... Um, that's so, that's yeah. so interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think one when, when, one interesting thing about the hellish experiences, um, which every piece of literature I've read on on this, is that the rate at which people report these is far less because of the nature of them. I mean, just when you think about, like, um, the experience in general, I mean, since because of the taboo, because of the whatever, like a lot of, like, you literally have some, for some people you have to, like, pull this out of them. Um even a pleasurable one. So yeah. how more so for like a, a hellish thing that you like don't want to talk about. So yeah. I think from a logical perspective, it would make sense that way more pleasurable ones would be reported than, and that seems to be the consensus of, amongst the field. Yeah, that's right. That's okay. right. Yeah. I think, I think people hear this um, and then they automatically, I mean, there's so many different belief systems probably good watching this right now, but um they might run to what prior religious belief was or, um, and I think that like that in itself isn't necessarily, and we talked about this indicative of, um, behavior. Um, even if you look in like the, the Bible, for example, Jesus saying that not says not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, basically saying that there are, 
be people that say they follow him, um, but might not enter in. And so I think, I think we're talking about the life review. We're talking about, um, uh, our behavior, our character, how our actions affect other people. And I think that like, what's tough about this is that only you really know, or only Mm -hmm. I really know like the content of what's going on in like my own heart. And Mm -hmm. only I'm having the interactions with, with people in terms of like how I'm affecting them. And so, yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit, like mm-hmm. that whole dynamic? Well, let me, let me, uh, I've had a few thoughts as I've listened to you uh, just now. One is that, uh, again, from research, we know that um, there's no relationship between the kind of life a person lived and whether they have a pleasurable or distressing experience. For example, um, there's a case of a woman who was a Um, drug addict, manipulative, prostitute, thief. I mean, she was like, you know, really a bad person as we would consider it in, you know, our social perspective. Um, Had a profoundly pleasurable near-death experience. And conversely, a man who was an assassin for the U.S. military, who had killed many people, um, uh, had a, a pleasurable experience. Um, Also, a woman who uh, was a minister and had, by all ways of measuring, been like a really good person, had a profoundly distressing experience. Hmm. So there's no relationship between um, a person's life experience and what kind of near-death experience they're going to have. And that's unfortunately not very comforting you know, um, for what everybody who's ever researched distressing experiences uh, ends up concluding that anybody can have a distressing experience. Mm. We don't really entirely, uh, we don't understand why. I think the thing that's interesting is like, what is a good person? Yeah. What is a bad person? Yeah. You know, I mean, obviously you could have judgments on a particular people group or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and from a societal standpoint, you could be like, oh, well, they're bad. I'm good. And we all, we always tend to think that like, we're, we have a bias towards ourselves Mm -hmm. that like, like we're a good person. Mm -hmm. I I do think what's again, interesting about the experience is like, these, these are, these are temporary deaths and then they come back versus like, this is, this wasn't a final thing. And I think what you said about, the insight um, is really interesting in the sense of like what someone needs for their own journey. Um, but there are people like uh, there was one case, his name, I think is Howard Storm. He was yeah. featured in a, a movie like last year who realized from a hellish experience that they weren't living well. Yeah, That's not, that's not the same thing as like they were totally hundred percent sure that like their behavior caused that experience. But he came back from that experience realizing that he wasn't yeah. living well. Yeah, yeah. So, And that's not unusual. Yeah. Yeah. And even people who have, you know, quote unquote, lived well, in the life review to, to experience what others that I've interacted with experience, they, they uh, go to a, no, a new level of, uh, of, caring and commitment to be, um, you know, kind and compassionate to other people. So, uh, so there's that kind of, um, learning yeah. for, you know, for just about everybody. Another thought that I had while you were talking a minute ago is, um, about, uh, that, uh, quote from Jesus about entering the kingdom of heaven. And, um, one of the things that I can say from near death research is that, uh, it is not um, pleasurable experiences, meeting the being of light and so forth, happens to people of all uh, belief systems mm, yeah. and all religions. And so um, there isn't a, um, a favoritism of people from one yeah. religion or another. What I found, uh, you know, obviously we're talking about, um, you know, living well, all of that stuff. Um, what I found to be really interesting about these discoveries um, is like the the mindset and messages that people come back with, which again we're like we're getting into kind of the after effects a little bit. 
One of the most striking things that I found from this, which I just I almost had like chills reading this, was this example in Dr. Bruce Grayson's book. He, he had this case, and this person gave this analogy of how we're in a huge dark warehouse, um, and referring to our life on Earth right now, we're in a huge dark warehouse. We have like a, a flashlight, right? And so like we could only see what's like directly in front of us with the flashlight, that doesn't mean that everything else is not there. It's just we can only see with that. Um, and then she had equated it to uh, imagine that one day someone flicks on a switch. Yeah. And then, you know, she said, in a sudden burst of brilliance and sound and color, you see the entire warehouse and it's nothing like you'd ever imagined. You see colors you don't recognize, ones you've never seen before. The vastness, complexity, depth, and breadth of everything going on around you is almost overwhelming. Um, and I just love that analogy so much. Yeah, um, it also great. speaks to the idea of like the mind and the brain, uh, the filtering of the the mind um, through the brain, um, and then it's like almost like some people have described it as that their mind had become free um, through that experience. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that is literal, but it's also metaphorical of like the, the message that comes back of like almost being, um, completely changed in your perspective of like, like why I'm here. Yeah. Um, and so I think there's a few themes of that. One of them is like the, the under, lying current of love. Can you, can you talk to me about that? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say that probably the, the biggest take home message that I, I have gathered from near death experiencers is that they, they say that the purpose of our lives on earth is to advance in our capacity to love. Mm. We're here to develop our ability to love. And, and so, you know, like, what does love mean? Well, my definition of love is that um, when, when I love, I'm invested in the survival and thriving of that which I love. So if I love you, I'm invested in you surviving and thriving. I love myself. I'm invested in my surviving and thriving. And, um, and that that's really what we're we're here to develop mm. and um and of course the challenges come when we encounter people who are don't have those intentions toward us and how can we remain loving toward them when they're not loving toward us and all that those are the, the yeah. challenges that you know life um wonderfully brings us and so, um, so that's that's really it. The the bottom line is mess, is love. And uh, and the second thing that NDEers say is that we're also here to learn, to advance in our knowledge. That somehow, when we learn things, we're contributing to the the knowledge of the all. And so, uh, so it boils down to loving and learning mm. is why we're here. Yeah, one person wrote. Um there's only one word that says it all, love. Uh, and the message is this, just as I have loved you, you must love one another. This is a uh, irrevocable truth, yeah. um, which I think is so interesting when you think about, um, I don't know if you've done work in the area of like attachment theory, um, and which essentially is, is one, another huge discovery in the field of psychology in the 20th century. Um, you know, that were hardwired for attachment from birth. Um, another way of saying this is hardwired for the need to love and be loved and, and have that care in our life. And so there's, there's these parallels that have been done in like randomized, like, like controlled studies when, with attachment theory, it's just like entirely this, this beautiful through line of like these messages that people are coming back versus what we're seeing in like, in like psychology. And another thing is, um, time. And so, kind of how people are using their time, how people are using their skills. One person said, uh, immediately the thought was communicated to me that all the skills and all the talents and everything that had been given, which I've been very, very, very blessed with, were for a purpose greater than the purpose I was using them for. Um, it really makes me think about the 
pursuits of life, yeah. of, of the pursuits of money or fame right. um, or, um, I don't know, success or all these things that outwardly that it feels like everybody is like pursuing these things because they feel like that is going to be the meaning in life. That's going to be mm-hmm. like the ultimate sense of happiness. Yeah. But it seems like people fundamentally come back with a different interpretation of their own skills and talents. That's right. Yeah. Uh, people become less materialistic, Mm. more concerned about others. So they tend to move into, um, service occupations afterwards, after their near death experience. Um, so yeah, there's a, uh, a, and and that's not to say that people don't enjoy material things. I'll never forget uh, the warehouse analogy you you were mentioning came from Anita Morjani. Mm. And one day at a, a con- an IONS conference a few years ago, uh, it, one of my tasks was to pick up Anita and her husband Danny at the airport and bring them to the conference hotel. And, and the hotel happened to be in a complex with a Macy's. And as we approached, approached the hotel, Anita was, oh, a Macy's, you know, so here's this near-death experiencer who's yeah. just so excited about going shopping. And and she said, you know, it's not that I don't enjoy material things, but they're not my priority anymore. My mm. life isn't primarily about um, material things. I enjoy, but um, also there's this other... Um, manifestation related to attachment, about being attached to things. And um, and uh, what NDEers say is, I enjoy material things without being attached to them. Mm. So if I lose them, it's okay. But while I have them, I can absolutely enjoy them. And that is one of the messages that a lot of people get in their NDE is that we're also here to enjoy this life. Yeah. You know, we're um, when we can, not that horrible things don't happen and You know, people um, experience tragic um, circumstances, but that uh, to the extent that we're able to, we're we're meant to enjoy this. Yeah. 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 That's so. That's so good. Um, Yeah, I think where I kind of wanted to land um, is to talk about the future of science, Um, and based on the data and and the evidence at hand with, with all this stuff, um, it seems that like materialism and we're defining that as like the, the physical world is all that exists is not the best explanation of reality. And you've talked about this in, um, some other interviews I've seen you, um, do, and you suggested that the future of science should be rooted in idealism, not materialism. So can you tell me about that a little bit? Yes. So idealism, as I understand it, because I'm not a, I'm not trained in philosophy, but it is essentially the idea that consciousness and the brain are not, um, that the brain doesn't produce consciousness, that consciousness is a, and the brain are essentially independent. And that um, it doesn't mean that, uh, it doesn't negate the uh, discoveries that have come out of a materialist perspective, it just broadens, yeah, broadens that, it, to yeah. say that, you know, yes, that, and there's also this, that there's also more, more than that. And that, um, that, that is that, that more is where a lot of, uh, meaning and purpose can derive that, that, eventually will bode well for for humanity the earth you know and all that yeah yeah that's good so i mean uh, based on in a more pointed question based on like your research um and expertise in this field like over 40 years um do you believe that science has proved the existence of the afterlife pim van lamel coined this uh phrase um, that uh, the evidence comes from many phenomena, not just near-death experiences. And when you take this, what he calls convergence of evidence from all of these different types of experiences, it points very definitely to the survival of consciousness after death. I think when we're considering materialism versus idealism, um, you know, a lot of people watching 
it could be like an overwhelming amount of, of information yeah. um, to kind of digest. Uh, and there was this, this uh, quote in the beginning pages of the self does not die kind of addressing this um, and how it is really understandable how people could respond emotionally or uh, to the idea of like, this is what my worldview has been. This is how I make sense of reality. And to consider that there's like something beyond that is like really could be distressing. Um, and so, you know, you've, you also are a counselor. Um, and so what would you say to like, to those people who are like trying to make sense of this um, and yeah. of like what we're talking about today? Well, I guess the first thing I would say is relax. Yeah. You know, it's okay. <laughs> and also that, um, yes, uh, this evidence can fundamentally change a person's concept of who they are, why they are here on earth, and what will happen to them after they die. Um, the good news is that the message is a fundamentally positive one mm. and uh that despite some of the bumps in the road you know the distressing near-death experiences and some of the after effect challenges that people have after having near-death experiences um ultimately uh the messages are positive about loving and learning and that uh it can involve quite a um quite an adaptation to bring one's life in line with what we know. And also that um, to know that it's okay if we mess up. Because one of the things that happens in the life review, people say that whatever they did, that, that they, in, you know, as they're watching it, they're like, oh my gosh, they, they just hate seeing what they did um, and, and feeling the effect of what they did on other people. The being of light is absolutely um, accepting. There's, there's a, a lot of NDEers describe that the being of light conveys the sense that, you know, you were learning. You were learning, and that's, this was part of your learning process. Mm. So, um, so the, the message is ultimately positive for people who can s succeed in making this transition to this kind of perspective. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So well, thank, thank you, you so much for your time. Being You're here today. so welcome, Matthew.